Good morning there, YouTubers. Today, I'm on a lake that uh, I've actually filmed that before. I I've done several videos here, including one of my more popular ones, which was Dodgers versus Lake Trolls. But I've also done some looking at leader length and other things here. So this was a very productive kokanee fishery for a very long time, several years in a row. And then about two years ago, it just completely collapsed and vanished. Now they're still dumping fish in here, so this is a uh, stocked lake. It's not wild reproduction. But for the past several years, they've been putting fish in here and it's been generating pretty much no viable kokanee fishery. Um, many people are coming out here and just catching nothing, myself included. Uh, and so today I want to discuss kokanee collapse. Now I really want to separate this from like normal kokanee population cycles. So kokanee cycle up and down in lakes, especially in lakes with wild reproduction. But even in lakes that are planted, there's just natural variation in the number of fish that will out migrate if it's a particularly high water year. Or maybe it's not a great year for zooplankton because it's cloudier and cooler and so the fish uh, don't have as much food and so you lose a fair number of the plants or maybe there's predation in the lake that uh, is variable so maybe the predator numbers go up those are what i consider fairly normal you can still go out on those lakes you know during the good years you can catch a ton of fish uh, relatively easy and during the tough years you can go out and you have to struggle for a few but i'm talking about lakes where the kokanee fishery essentially vanished all together and actually there's exceedingly few examples of this um, but I wanted to talk about the examples that I do know of and what the underlying causes of those uh, collapses were if we know. So the first example that I can think of is a lake called Lake Nantanhala and you're like where the heck is Lake Nantanhala? Lake Nantanhala is in western North Carolina, and for a time, that lake was producing two to four pound kokanee fairly consistently. And uh, it was primarily a lake that depended on natural spawning kokanee in the upper portions of the lake. There was a river there they would run up into and spawn. Uh, but what happened with that lake is sometime in the mid 2000s early 2000s like around 2005 2006 um somebody introduced uh, a species of fish called blueback herring into that lake and blueback herring um is a filter feeder just like kokanee very prolific uh invasive species and uh, it outcompeted those kokanee so dramatically that it pretty much wiped out that kokanee population in a matter of years. So this is a example of interspecific competition. That is competition between two different species that eventually one a species outcompetes the other. And apparently these fish were so effective at removing the zooplankton community or reducing the zooplankton community that the kokanee didn't have enough resources to survive and make it to spawn and that led to a coll entire collapse of that fishery um, nobody's catching kokanee out of Nansenhala in any uh, what i would call sustainable fishery numbers that i've heard of now the state of north carolina is trying to reintroduce kokanee and reestablish them um, but it's going to be an uphill battle if they've got this invasive species issue. And that's one of the few examples I can think of that I've seen where invasive species directly contributed to the demise of a kokanee fishery um, in the United States. Um, now, I've got plenty of examples where things like alewife and uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels have caused kokanee populations to stunt. So basically those species are competing so effectively they've caused the average size of kokanee to decline, but not a complete collapse of those fisheries. So that's a very interesting one. And I think that scenario is probably more likely to happen in lakes where they're really dependent on these wild spawning populations. Um, if you want to call them wild, you can call them feral. Um, and 
there's no additional inputs of fish. So if you're dependent upon the fish in the lake to create the next generation, then you're probably more vulnerable to uh, invasive species and interspecific competition. Now, another example of complete kokanee collapse actually brings me back to my home state here, and that is Palmer Lake. So Palmer Lake is a big natural uh, lake in north central Washington that used to produce kokanee in the 15 to 18 inch uh, size class pretty much year after year. It depended primarily on um, natural spawning fish, but they did supplement um, with uh, hatchery plants on occasion. Uh, but what happened is there was a several years of very intense drought and heat. And of course, we're in a two decade long drought here in north central Washington. And we seem to be breaking uh, our heat records year after year up here. And what happened in that lake, now this is a massive deep lake and it just shows the vulnerability of our kokanee populations to uh, a warming climate. So the water temperatures in that lake got so high that it caused uh, a huge copepod bloom. And with a combination of warm temperatures, uh, warm water temperatures, which stresses the fish and reduces their ability to fight off uh, infection and, and by parasites, uh, they got, oh, there's fish. Probably gonna be a rainbow trout, but. Um, with the increased heat, they were unable to fight off infection and they got these in very intense uh, parasite infections in their gills and those fish just died off. Very few fish returned to the stream to spawn and uh, they lost that fishery. So that's one of the few examples I can think of where actually climate and disease specifically caused uh, a complete collapse of a kokanee population. Now they've been working to restore that population um, with hatchery plants, but they've had really mixed success with that. But hopefully we'll see that population come back over the next uh, several years. It's a rainbow trout. Like I predicted. That's all I seem to catch here anymore. Pretty one. So we've already identified two causes of kokanee collapse. One being a competition with invasive species. And the other being a combination of a warming climate and uh, essentially a disease. There's another example. Um, when I lived in North Idaho, I lived right on the shores of Lake Pend Oreille. And while I was there, the kokanee fishery there was just starting to make a comeback. But for decades, that fishery had pretty much completely collapsed. Like there was really no viable kokanee fishery. And what's interesting about Lake Pend Oreille is historically it actually had a commercial kokanee fishery. That kokanee fishery was so productive, primarily driven by wild spawning fish that either run into the streams or shore spawn, that it supported a commercial fishery. In fact, a lot of my customers when I worked at a sporting goods store there would come in, especially my older customers, they would tell me about they used to go down and still fish for handline kokanee in um, as part of a way to make money during the summer when they were kids. They'd go down on these floating docks and, and catch kokanee to make money. Uh, but what happened is the lake trout or Mackinac population in that lake absolutely exploded. And uh, they essentially ate their way through that kokanee population. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is Lake Pend Oreille is home to a very large strain of rainbow trout that comes out of Canada called Kamloops, sometimes called Gerard's uh, rainbow trout. And uh, those trout go to very large sizes feeding on kokanee. And so there was a lot of concern about, you know, A, the 
the the rainbow trout were getting more stunted because there was not enough of a food base for them because the kokanee were gone and uh, also they wanted to restore that kokanee population so they started a very aggressive netting campaign to net out all the Mackinac. They, they used the same approach that they were using in Yellowstone Lake um, to net out the, the lake trout uh, to help out the native cutthroat there. So they started a very aggressive uh, netting campaign where they were netting these fish very deep and shallow and they really whacked the lake trout population back. At the same time, they were working to do gravel spills um, in historic uh, kokanee uh, lake spawning areas. So they would dump down fresh gravel to create artificial spawning areas for uh, shore spawning kokanee. And there was just a massive response by the kokanee due to the lack of predation and the simultaneous increase in spawning habitat. And that that kokanee population bounced back. So it shows that, so this is a really, there's fish. That bees off. So that Lake Ponderay example is a really good example of how predation can cause a kokanee population to collapse. It's the only example that I know of uh, where predation was the identified culprit. Um, you know, there's a lot of lakes that I kokanee fish that have predators of kokanee. In fact, those are the lakes I actually prefer to fish because our state overstocks a lot of kokanee lakes. And so the lakes without predators tend to be stunted and just a bunch of dink fish whereas the lakes with predators tend to get tend to get knocked back a little bit to the point where there actually is enough food resources to grow some fairly uh, impressive sized kokanee. Now a fourth example is going to be entrainment and you might be wondering well what is entrainment? Entrainment is essentially uh, out migration of kokanee out of a lake. Now we have to remember that uh, kokanee are landlocked sockeye salmon and like wild sockeye salmon who are anadromous, they have that same urge to move downstream especially when they're young and out migrate to the ocean. And uh, we see this on Lake Roosevelt quite a bit, especially uh, when I first moved to the Okanagan five or six years ago there was a, a very, very, very wet winter. We had a very wet spring. There was just a massive quantity of water coming down the Columbia. And so they had the gates open at uh, Grand Coulee for, it seemed like forever, uh, late into the summer. They started early. And a lot of the kokanee out migrated. Until that time, I was enjoying really great success catching large 20 inch kokanee and it just seemed like all the kokanee left Lake Roosevelt and for the next two years afterwards it was just very very poor kokanee fishing like people were just picking up one here and there it really wasn't a viable fishery um, of course that was followed by a, a couple very dry and hot uh, years and low water and the fishing actually picked back up because there was fish uh, there was still some natural recruitment going on um, and that fishery started to recover as fish weren't out migrating. But that's a very unique situation. Not, not Most of our kokanee fisheries will not face that sort of issue with uh, entrainment with fish uh, out migrating out of their lakes. But it does happen on a few lakes and it really can set back a kokanee fishery by one or more years. So that brings us to this lake I'm at today. What happened at this lake? Now this lake's been experiencing the same heat and droughts as other nearby lakes, but they've continued to thrive. Uh, as I fished this lake and watched this fishery decline, I didn't really see a spike in the presence of copepods. I didn't hear about any large fish kills out here. And most interestingly, this lake has a sister lake less than a mile away that also used to consistently produce quality kokanee. And it's likewise seen a similar 
decline, albeit not as extreme as this lake, which lies slightly downstream. So that to me would suggest some sort of nutrient cycling or some sort of water quality issue. Um, but truth be told, sometimes these fisheries just collapse and we have no idea actually what happened. Biological systems are extremely complex. There's lots of what we call abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic is like those environmental factors like climate um, or fire. So this, this area has had fire in the last couple of years, which is going to disrupt the nutrient cycling in these lakes pretty substantially. You're going to get runoff of things like um, ash and all of the detrimental things that that can cause to fish. Um, interestingly, I think there might be something to the fire argument for this lake because uh, the rainbow trout fishery in here used to just be, there used to be so many trout in here that it was actually annoying to fish for kokanee in here. Um, now, you know, I'm lucky if I catch two or three on an average outing out here. So there's definitely been a fundamental shift, but there are also those biotic factors, right? So that could be competition, which doesn't seem to be likely here since there's not a lot of other species that would compete with kokanee. I look down here and I see an abundance of phytoplankton and algae and little daphnia and things swimming around. So it doesn't seem to be a food resource issue. <laughs> Like I said, I didn't see any sort of disease prevalence um, leading up to the collapse. So that that is part of the challenge of of all fisheries management. And you know, I'm I'm fairly quick to be critical of fisheries management um, because I feel like there's a lot of common, easily correctable mistakes that our fish and game department makes in terms of how they manage our fisheries. But at the same time. I'm when a fishery like this collapses and I they're putting fish in here and it's not thriving I'm not going to blame them aimlessly um, without some sort of evidence to support it and managing fish is challenging it's a there's a lot of things going on that um, are difficult to identify and overcome and some of them are simply just beyond their control uh, that being said, one of the things I wanted to point out, something that um, I think I get the most flack about, is over harvest. And, you know, a lot of people, um, I've been very expressive on my, <laughs> that's a polite way of putting it, I expressed on my videos about, um, you know, blowing out small lakes and giving away information on small lakes. Generally, I feel like over harvest is probably one of the least important threats to kokanee fisheries. Now, I won't give away every kokanee lake, and that's not because I'm afraid of over harvest, because I think most lakes, it, it doesn't matter to me if people come out and harvest every last kokanee, because most of the lakes that I fish are planted lakes anyways. All those fish are just going to die in the lake and not propagate the next generation. And the more people fish a lake, the, the more kokanee get taken out, the larger the kokanee get. And I'd much rather go out and catch two or three giants than ten dinks. Um, generally, the only reason I will not give away a kokanee lake is just because I, if I feel like the boat ramps can't handle the pressure or the um, there's just not enough parking, and that I don't want to cause conflict on that level. So, generally, that's the only reason I'm not going to say where I'm fishing. But it does it does boggle my mind, like how many people honestly believe that like harvesting all the kokanee out of the lake is a bad thing. I mean, the state spends money producing kokanee using the funds that we generate through license sales. That's our money. I, to me, I'd rather maximize the usage of these fish than to just simply waste them as dead material at the bottom of the lakes when they spawn out and die in the next few months because the, the, we're nearing the fall. Um, I cannot think of a single example, or nor have I ever talked to anyone who believes their kokanee fishery collapsed due to overharvest. I think people need to get moved past this whole concept of overharvest. Um, there's, it simply doesn't exist, in my opinion, for kokanee. 
All right, guys, if you disagree with me, I'd love to hear in the comment section, and I know I will. If you have any examples of kokanee collapse on your local fisheries, I'd love to hear what happened in that scenario. Has the fishery recovered, or has it gone forever? Let me know in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time out on the water. Just remember, fish smarter, not harder. Bye, guys.